on many topics, uh, stand dynamics, carbon, et cetera. Um, one opportunity with the pandemic, uh, COVID, is that uh, the USDA is doing kind of an experiment on me and giving me the opportunity to serve in Washington uh, virtually as a scientist. They usually don't have scientists serve on the staff there. So I serve as an interface between uh, USDA Forest Service scientists and uh, policymakers on a number of issues. Of course, AR, afforestation, reforestation is one of them. So quickly, the outline, I'll talk about uh, policy directions in the US, uh, recent ones, our resource situation. So this is gonna be US focused talk on AR, definitely, but talking about quantitative results uh, and how that kind of links to some of the prior talks which we, you just heard from. So with the new administration, President Biden coming in and a new Congress, there's been a real push in the United States toward what we we're calling climate smart forestry practices. Aforestation and reforestation is one of those practices in a toolbox of, of numerous ones. Uh, you're seeing this uh, kind of uh, policy push come out in numerous uh, fora, such as United Nations uh, INDC from the US, where we're talking about here in 2021, supporting the scaling of climate smart uh, practices, including reforestation, uh, our own Department of Agriculture, uh, sending out uh, orders to start to prepare our organization to track the benefits of such practices. Uh, I'm the lead coordinating author of uh, our revisions to greenhouse gas guidelines, uh, which will be coming out later this year, as far as default uh, AR rates for carbon accumulation. Uh, topics that Susan had, had taught, touched on. Uh, the White House here in January uh, announced uh, a task force in our agency to really improve our monitoring of greenhouse gases, especially focused on ag and forests. Uh, I'm the representative for the Forest Service to that White House working group currently. And then we have here just more recently from, from the president, the Earth Day announcement of an order to strengthen America's forests. So uh, that's a human emotion. And so when a scientist thinks about strengthening, we got to, what does that mean? How do we turn that into objective analysis and information to inform policy? And some of these uh, topics beyond AR, now we're talking about safeguarding mature and old growth forests, starting on federal lands where we can have that influence. Science-based approaches to wildfires, I'll touch on that. That's a huge issue in the United States. Our reforestation partnerships, the Nature Conservancy is a, is a strong partner of the United States uh, on reforestation. Uh, and also obviously deploying even more nature-based solutions across the landscape and land use, uh, such as Mark raised, is an important, very important piece of that puzzle, if not the most important piece. So um, those are the presidential actions. Congress is, 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 is literally tossing billions um, at this through various funding mechanisms. A lot of this is focused on wildland firefighting to do with the wildfire crisis, which is related to climate change, of course, but there's many other forest related uh, uh, activities such as reforestation uh, and that kind of restoration management, et cetera, potentially uh, uh, old growth mature conditions across the US. So briefly, the US forest resource background. How did we get to where we are currently today with many nations? Uh, the US is not alone. It's really a combination of that land use history for the US. We have a, a diversity of ecosystems from boreal to tropical. All these are spatially commingled across time, et cetera, and all uh, you know, suffering from global change affects climate change. Insects and disease is a tremendous problem. Invasives and browse, that is very important for afforestation, reforestation, you plant a tree, in parts of the U.S., deer will eat it <laughs> the next day, and if it survives the year five, it's going to might be overtaken by invasives uh, um, that are taken over forest sites. And obviously, with with COVID uh, and now with the war in Ukraine, uh, markets are changing rapidly. Uh, development as far as land use change and what, how we're using the land base is changing rapidly, so it's hard for the science uh, to keep up with all this. Uh, here we have just kind of representation for the U.S. Uh, situation. Um, largely, when the U.S. was settled by Europeans, uh, you know, a few hundred years ago, mature forest largely across the U.S., uh, deforestation was widespread um, in the 1700s, 1800s, but a lot of the U.S., especially eastern U.S., has been in a period of recovery in the past hundred years with uh, uh, kind of reforestation naturally occurring, 
a uh, little bit different situation out west. Out west, we now have this situation of um, <laughs> the wildfire crisis, as we're calling it. Uh, if we look at the attributes of U.S. force, so since I work for the Forest Inventory Program, which has been going on for about 100 years in the United States, we can look at change uh, very coarsely, but across the entire uh, U.S. in terms of uh, force attributes. Um, so I won't go into too many details here, uh, lack the time, but forest area has been fairly stable in the U.S. the past few years, but we're having really strong indications of the tide turning on that and starting to lose net forest area. And that is being attributed to development, which uh, we believe is gonna be exacerbated with the new data coming in regarding uh, COVID and people moving out of cities and deforesting and building homes. Um, at the same time, a little bit less forest area, slightly stable. Uh, our live tree abundance is, is being reduced, the number of trees, not talking about size, just number, we have less trees now than we did 20 years ago in the United States. But our merchantable volume is greatly increasing. If we look at biomass, it's even more has increased. So this really comes back to talking about self-thinning, stand stocking, canopy coverage, et cetera. Uh, we are updating our biomass models because they, uh, which will be implemented in the greenhouse gas inventory in a couple of months. We've been doing a 10 year study across the US, across our over 200 species. Uh, we underestimated crown limb biomass. Our biomass is, is gonna increase by 10 to 20% in the United States tree biomass when we implement the new models in a few months here. So you're gonna see even more uh, potential uh, increase in biomass. If we go back to Connecting this to emissions and sequestration for the United States across time, talked about 1600s to the present, uh, huge emissions, we assume, when the land was converted to agriculture, et cetera, in the eastern United States, going into the Midwest, uh, and that re kind of reforestation and maturing just broadly of the U.S. force uh, over the past 100 years, uh, we're tracking the past 20 years uh, for you know UNF triple C, that's the green line here, we're still seeing sequestration, but that sink strength is being reduced as you see that line creep up. So talk about afforestation, reforestation opportunities uh, as a more kind of traditional forester, I come back to stand management metrics. Uh, this is where it's implemented on the ground at the, at the stand level with people planting, planting trees, so manual labor, right? Uh, we look at this broadly, the size density relationship with U.S. force. And in the 2000s, uh, we estimated for CONUS, continental U.S., just broadly uh, a trillion seedlings. So those are most likely mostly natural regeneration, right, uh, for the United States. So we, we've already had Mother Nature provide a trillion tree seedlings out there. But the key thing is that that recruitment to the saplings, are, are, the, are they making it? You know, we don't expect all, like, <laughs> we're going to have a trillion new saplings, right? There's going to be that self-thinning mortality, et cetera, to get to that sapling size, about 40 billion. And then the largest trees, 1.1 billion. Uh, and just generally 2010, uh, 10s, currently, uh, the past 10 years, uh, that population estimate for seedlings has dropped a little bit, less seedlings, less saplings, more large trees. So uh, when we think about the uh, presidential kind of announcements of, you know, let's protect the large trees and, and, and you know, increase seedlings. You know, we need to interpret those kind of policy decisions uh, against our objective information on that topic. So an important part of talking about the maybe just the kind of, just kind of general maturing of U.S. forests and opportunities to, to plant more, to create more forest. Uh, an important thing I want to relay is that with that maturing is that transfer of carbon. And uh, we're seeing the live trees, the shift, like I said, less smaller trees, more larger trees. But how about standing dead trees and down dead trees? We're seeing that reflected. A hypothesis would be that you're having the small trees die, fall over. We're seeing a slight increase in our uh, standing dead trees as far as the smallest ones as uh, force across the U.S. kind of uh, a number of places reach that kind of level of maturity with full canopy coverage or closure. Um, down dead, same thing, more smaller down dead wood pieces as an indicator of, uh, of those kind of stand dynamics just broadly across the U.S. So to start thinking about where it might be an opportunity for current forest, not talking about reforesting like other land uses right now, uh, that, that's a huge part of the equation. 
but looking at uh, current forests in the U.S. that might be understocked with uh, uh, or highly disturbed, degraded with uh, you know uh, reforestation opportunities. Using stand density index uh, as a as a metric of stand density is uh, very popular in some uh, circles of forest management uh, uh, management tool. So we we parameterize this approach at the national level where we can estimate any plots, uh, current stand density index, estimate what its maximum might be with that current kind of species distribution uh, and size uh, distribution and estimate a relative density. Um, so when we calculate that, uh, uh, US forests, uh, the current forests are, have become more increasingly dense uh, over time, the 2000s to the 20. 20s, so over 20 years, see a, sh a shift uh, here to the right, um, which I'll revisit later as far as uh, at the end of the talk here. But um, if we look by stocking classes, and this is very common uh, in the US to kind of look at relative density, zero to 0.3 is considered understock, it's not full canopy closure. There could be an opportunity to really uh, engage in uh, reforestation planting activities where natural regeneration can't. Uh, uh, afford that regeneration uh, potential. Uh, between 0.3 and 0.6, typically that's canopy closure. Uh, as far as relative density, we've seen tremendous increases in that in the U.S. Uh, like I said, below, uh, as far as the lower uh, stocking classes where there might be uh, canopy openings, opportunity has not really significantly changed, but the uh, stands that are at that threshold of uh, full canopy closure, if not entering self-thinning, a lot of mortality, uh, have greatly increased. That's why I'm talking about the future carbon balance going to be uh, an important component of that is the transfer from uh, dead to live, sorry, live dead pools. Um, if we overlay uh, that th these results with uh, forecasts of future droughts, uh, those low relative uh, density stands where there might be uh, uh, reforestation opportunities, uh, most of them, a lot of it, plurality, uh, yep, yep, pretty close to polarity. Majority are severe, very severe forecasted future droughts. So if we're going to be planting in these areas, uh, what's the survival potential in the future? Uh, as far as monitoring, I talked about that sapling kind of recruitment. We have questions about how we come up with seedling stocking metrics objectively. How much do we plant? Uh, are we overplanting, underplanting? What tools can we develop for the future? In the U.S., we used to just, well, we still do, just count the seedlings above a certain height and that's it. Uh, we've been doing a study over the past decade of actually across 20 states um, having height classes. And we find a lot more kind of like a strong correlation between the tallest height classes and sapling recruitment. So maybe we can save time, money, and maybe just uh, measure the tallest seedlings that we have there, the strongest indicator of sapling recruitment and really get uh, more kind of proactive and refined with our approaches on monitoring uh, seedling stocking. Finally, the topic uh, I, I want to touch on is, is forest carbon. Uh, when we talk about natural climate solutions uh, uh, and the a and afforestation, reforestation, it all comes down to carbon. And one major policy issue right currently in the United States uh, is the uh, number and availability uh, of uh, high quality forest carbon credits and offsets in the private markets. Uh, it could be a multi-billion dollar industry in the future. All these uh, corporations are coming to the United States Forest Service seeing if we're gonna sell uh, uh, carbon credits. Uh, <laughs> short answer is no right now. Uh, we need Congress to give us the authority. It would be illegal, but we're, we're talking to everybody. Um, which of course includes uh, TNC. Um, so those, those interests on the other side uh, are communities that are suffering from wildfires. Uh, we have laws, the wildfire laws, we just talked about that is talking about taking carbon out of forest to thinning and prescribed fire to reduce the hazards to communities, et cetera, which could also really open up a lot of opportunities uh, for reforestation, adaptive civil culture, et cetera. We're already seeing uh, results uh, of emerging greenhouse gas inventories by state. Western states are now net, emitting, net emitters of forest carbon with transfers uh, from live to dead or burnt to the atmosphere, right, combustion. Um, so we expect this trend to continue uh, in the United States. 
hence why you see a lot of concern coming out of the White House and Congress about Western forests. Uh, something to think about, hypotheses here, two futures for these Western forests, uh, potentially. Uh, this is where science comes to bear. The left side here is a kind of pictorial, if, if no management and overstocked and catastrophic fire, you have a tight conversion with an inherently less carbon storage. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, maybe you can get some reforestation and it can come back. But the question is, for scientists, what is that net carbon uh, exactly? Uh, another alternative is coupling that with long-lived harvested wood products. Can we build, you know, uh, we have a housing crisis in the U.S., hence deforestation. Can we build uh, more kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, dense, uh, you know, housing uh, structures with uh, wood and afford an opportunity to get in there for uh, density reduction, uh, adaptive management practices, and looking at reforestation with future adapted species. So a real big area of, of science, hypothesis testing, et cetera, right now. And just to relay, I like this uh, pictorial uh, image uh, from 1800s to the present of a Western, in Colorado, uh, following the Hayman fire. Uh, you see what uh, the forest conditions were 100 years ago. Uh, what they potentially have been in the past 20 years as far as uh, stocking and uh, what happens after a catastrophic wildfire. And uh, I, I, I tease my NASA colleagues with this, we're working on satellite, next generation satellite ideas. And it's like, <laughs> your experience at monitoring uh, you know, Mars, so you're gonna be ready to help us in the future with these kind of situations. And AR um, you know, is, is, is tough in these situations as far as uh, survival of seedlings when you try to reforest. Uh, finally, just a couple of things. Uh, relative density uh, also potentially has a, a way, a uh, role to play in carbon markets. Currently working with uh, California and their Air Resources Board on evaluating, incorporating relative density in their approaches as opposed to basal area. Uh, here they have their market standards, uh, softwood, hardwood versus low versus high quality sites. Quickly, just the important thing here is this kind of center figure uh, really, when you look at that kind of size density relationship, it really helps you understand mortality. And so current market standards uh, may be rewarding uh, the same net sequestration, but a huge kind of difference in mortality, which is a risk of emission. So in encumbering mortality in the present that we maybe don't have to encumber. Although it's very important for the carbon cycle, I understand, but the Western wildfire crisis is pretty huge in the U.S. So to close out, uh, keep us on, 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 on task here, I, I believe, hopefully. So, um, so looking about and back at that, this figure and where we kind of stand, uh, maybe looking at two sides of this distribution. So where, where we, where current force, uh, maybe are understocked, maybe there are opportunities to increase the carbon. And so, uh, uh we feel that, uh, in, you know, uh, improving regeneration monitoring metrics is, are very important in the, con in the context of natural climate solutions. What is the information they need? Uh, I, I'll speak to Susan's comment about having those AR rates. I'm pushing really hard with the development team right now on open source development, dynamic coupling of these metrics with our national databases uh, where anybody in the world can API in, run the query with the data that just arrived yesterday, keep have this dynamic updating and in consultation uh, with NASA and speaking about the next gen uh, JEDI missions. Well, we don't want a mission anymore from the Forest Service actually. You want a national platform that can be global and not a mission like Landsat <laughs> occurs into the future. So it, it's, I know NASA likes their missions, but we need, we need something uh, we measured well into the future on this. So. Uh, so we're ha having those discussions. Uh, the other thing is designing future forests. And I am um, involved in adaptive civil culture projects. So what does it look like with novel species that we're planting in uh, structures, uh, you know, adapted for the future, uh, which we know is going to accelerate uh, in terms of change. And competition and land uses marks very good, very good talk, very good points about how do we rectify this with agriculture, uh, especially you know, in the U.S. situation, probably the best reforestation opportunities uh, might be uh, on uh, agricultural lands, which were forests uh, in a number of situations uh, over 100 years ago. And so in, we look at the right side here, uh, these stands that are well-stocked, 
Uh, overstock's not bad. I'm not putting a value judgment on that. That's a lot of transfer of carbon to dead wood stocks and the soils, et cetera. But you need to understand your emission risks with those. You need to understand uh, that the risk of a lot of stock sitting there in the landscape in a changing environment versus current sequestration rates. What does that mean? And those transfers among pools. How do we connect a long lived forest products as opposed to concrete and steel in terms of uh, housing people across the landscape, especially if they're in the US, the major cause of deforestation with building homes uh, and second homes, third homes, whatever. Um, and finally, uh, across, variations across space time is very important. What's going to be our future old growth uh, that we're focusing on? So thanks for your time. Sorry for, for kind of uh, rushing things. I had many uh, points I wanted to touch on and hopefully uh, all this kind of uh, aligns with the excellent talks that uh, preceded on this topic. So uh, thank you. Chris, for your very interesting presentation. Um, we're a bit behind in schedule, but I think we have time for a couple of questions, yeah? Yeah, it's 10 minutes, all right. Rich. A uh, question for Mark. You said earlier in your talk, uh, the commitment to plant 3 billion trees. I'm wondering if there's an equal commitment to make sure those trees are alive one year later 